Today is Sunday, September 22. I'm Pastor Anthony, and this is Wilderness Wanderings. Today we continue on our series on the spiritual disciplines. Today our focus is worship, and the text is Matthew 14, verses 22 to 36. If you'd like to catch the full worship service that the sermon comes from, you can always find the YouTube link down in the notes. And for now, may God bless you as you hear His Word. You've maybe heard this. It happens in movie soundtracks. It happens in Bach, like in his St. Matthew's Passion, and, and in any number of other classical scores. It goes like this. You know, first the oboes pick up a half line of the theme, just enough for us to say, oh, I, I think I recognize that. And then poof, it's gone. Then a few moments later, the cellos carry the theme in low resonance underneath some other melody, barely perceptible. But finally, after the great composer has played with us this way for untold bars, whetting our appetite for the main event, all at once we arrive. All the distraction and dissonance is cut away from the music and we hear the magnificent melody of the main theme cut crisp and clear in the full-throated voice of the entire orchestra together in concert. We have reached the climax, the resolution, and having been prepared in this way for its arrival, we are all the better for it. Matthew does the same thing in his gospel. His main theme is the death and resurrection of Jesus, by which Jesus saves and forgives his doubting, sinning, faithless people. Death and resurrection is the way that Jesus' kingdom comes. And so, death and resurrection is the way that Matthew's gospel comes too. Matthew paints this theme of death and resurrection over and over again in the background in different ways and words and with different angles on what it all means until we finally, we're finally ready to witness the real thing of a cross and an empty tomb at the gospel's end. Now, maybe some of you will recall the last sermon that I preached about a month ago now on Matthew 8. Or maybe you don't remember back that far, or maybe you weren't here. In any case, I will refresh you, because that story is directly parallel to this one. It is another story of the disciples caught up in a great storm in their little boat. In that first story, Jesus was asleep. In the current story, He's absent. In both stories, the disciples eventually cry out to be saved, and they are. But there are more parallels than that. In the first story, Matthew describes the storm on the lake as a great earthquake. Earthquake being a word that he only uses two other times in the gospel, at Jesus' death and at Jesus' resurrection. Similarly, Jesus asleep in the boat is a euphemism for his death, even as Jesus waking to still the storm is a euphemism for his resurrection life that saves his church. So it's barely perceptible underneath, but, but there you go. Matthew, the great composer, is weaving his great theme of death and resurrection through this small story of salvation. Yes, Matthew says, Jesus does indeed save his little church boat, and he does it through death and resurrection. Wait and see, remember, and believe. Alas, however, that first story in chapter 8 ends not with belief on the part of the disciples. That story doesn't even end with disciples. It is mere men we're left with at the end of the story who ask this haunting question of Jesus, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Okay, fast forward to our text today, here in chapter 14. Act two, there we go. Here we're crossing over water with disciples in a storm-tossed boat once again. No earthquakes or sleeping and waking this time, but you better believe that the theme of death and resurrection is still trilling somewhere in the background, just that some other instruments have picked up the theme this time around. It begins a bit earlier in Matthew 14, in the story just prior to ours with Jesus feeding the 5,000. That story is a picture of the Lord's Supper, the last supper that Jesus eats with his disciples on the night he is betrayed. So there we go. 
were set in the upper room. Next, after dismissing this crowd that he has just fed, Jesus then goes up on a mountainside alone to pray, much like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane, after the Last Supper and before he was arrested. That moment, like this one, very clearly takes place when it was dark at night. Meanwhile, the disciples are left alone, abandoned in their little boat while storms rage and wind howls around them much as they would be overnight from Thursday to Friday following Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. But then the story takes a jump forward. The main action of Matthew 14, of this story, takes place during the fourth and final watch of the night, which is those hours during which dawn begins to break and the sun begins to rise. Jesus comes to the disciples on the water, in just as impossible of a way as he does when he comes back to them in resurrection. They cannot believe it. Jesus comes to them not as some ghost of a crucified Good Friday dead person, that's what they thought, but no, actually Jesus comes to them as the living God of resurrection life. The great I am who declares, take heart, do not be afraid. In the midst of the storm, we just catch this cutting glimpse of Jesus revealed in his resurrection glory, not dead but alive. Unlike the last story, at this encounter with the Lord of resurrection life, the disciples take a wee step forward in faith. Instead of this story ending only in questions, this story of Matthew 14 ends in worship of the Son of God. In Matthew 8, only the demons know that this is the Son of God. The disciples haven't figured it out yet. But here they do. And by the time their little boat arrives on the other shore, the sun has risen full strength. Faith is strong. And five times over, in absolute terms, we are told that all who come are healed. All the sick from all the surrounding country all come and touch him, and all of them are healed. Period. No doubt, no wavering, no darkness at all. What I would like to suggest to you is that this theme of death and resurrection that Matthew weaves through his gospel in these small, subtle ways is the very same theme that the church rehearses every single Sunday in worship. And I think Matthew and some other gospel writers think the same. Which is why the little boat at the end of the story transforms into exactly this, the church worshiping its Lord. That's the punchline of the whole story. After witnessing all of these things, those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. The boat becomes the church sanctuary. The disciples become the worshippers. And just like Sunday worship, Maestro Matthew is convinced that one and done is just not enough. We have to hear the theme of death and resurrection repeatedly. We have to partake in the means of our salvation habitually if we are to have any chance of taking a step forward in faith. To remember that Jesus alone saves us, we have to be reminded often. To believe that his death and resurrection are sufficient for anything we face, we have to rehearse the drama until it becomes our own. Why? Because there are some strong winds and some tall waves out there. And if we aren't rehearsing the fundamentals with some frequency, those winds will blow us off course. We tend to think the biggest issues that we face are the things that we need saving from. The death and decline of the church. The cultural onslaught of secularism. The Trudeau liberals. Polyev and his conservatives, Trump, Harris, global wars, housing crises, affordability crises, health crises, you name it. Or problems closer to home. Diagnoses, treatment courses, concerns about parents, concerns about children, money, job security, substance abuse, mental health challenges. All of these are major problems that take up so much of our bandwidth. And they are as unique to each of us as the clothing that we wear. In the story of Matthew 14, all of these problems, whatever they are for you, whatever they are for us, they are all together represented by the chaos 
of the waters. Stirred up into a frenzy by the winds of the world that lay outside of the disciples' control. In their little boat, they are buffeted, they are tortured, they are suffering from the constant knock of the waves. These waters have again become what they were in the Matthew 8 story. They are the mythical sea of primordial chaos that threatens to take human lives and plunge them back into the dark void of uncreation. These are the dark waters of destruction over which the Spirit brooded in Genesis 1 verse 2 before God said, let there be light. They are the waters of the Red Sea that drowned the Egyptian. They are the waters of the flood that wiped out all living things. They are the waters of the baptismal font. The waters of death into which our Lord plunged when he breathed his last on the cross. But they are not waters that have the last word. Or any word, frankly. As we discover here in Matthew 14, Jesus strolls atop these wind-tossed waters as if, they were, as if they were streets paved with gold in a kingdom the disciples had yet to see and believe. We tend to think that the biggest issues are the things that we need saving from. The wind and the waters of chaos that fill our horizon, all of our vision, and that threaten death and destruction at every turn. But that's simply not true. In the deadly dark storm of chaos that night, a new figure began to take form on the horizon. No ghost of death, but the risen Lord of life speaking words of courage, of hope, and an invitation to let go of fear in his presence. Peter's bold, if often half-cocked, faith sparks to life. But it's a true faith. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, come. And Peter does come. For a brief moment, Peter too walked on the paved streets of the kingdom of life, as long as his attention was on the king. With eyes fixed on Jesus, the wind, while still howling, ceased to tear at Peter. The waves, while still smashing against his ankles, somehow did not disturb his peace in the presence of the king. For a brief moment, Peter rested in the peace and the joy of the risen Lord, even while remaining amidst the storm-tossed world of chaos. But then Peter left the worship service and took his eyes off Jesus. The logic of his Monday to Friday workaday world reasserted its influence on his life. The wind once again caught his ears, the waves caught his eyes, and the peace that he had enjoyed in the presence of his Savior, that space of sanctuary, was snatched away by fear. And Peter began to sink. Just as the waters of death and chaos were about to totally consume him, Peter cried out to the Lord to save him. He remembered. And Jesus did save him. Peter was raised up from the deathly waters to new life. Baptized. Even if Peter had forgotten and lost Jesus for the wind, Jesus had not forgotten nor abandoned Peter. Because of the resurrection of his Lord of life in whom Peter took refuge, these waters of death no longer had the last word. Peter had thought that the biggest issue he faced was the wind and the waves. But as it turned out, those only happened to be the things that he was paying attention to. Once his attention snapped back to Jesus, life and salvation swallowed up the storm in a blink. The waters fell flat. The kingdom streets reappeared solid and true, carrying Jesus and Peter safely back to the boat. The boat, which became the heavenly sanctuary. Planks turned to church pews. And like that, the drama resolved into worship of none other than the Son of God. We tend to think that the biggest issues we face are the things that we need saving from. The chaos, the death, the disease, the darkness, the destruction that at every waking moment threatens our lives at every turn in this still sin-broken world. And those things are problems, to be sure. But the far bigger issue we face is the Lord of life who strides atop the storm offering safe harbor in the gale. 
The trick is, how do we focus our attention on the right crisis? The crisis of the living God, rather than the crisis of the deathly storms. I believe, and I think our gospel writers like Matthew and John do too, that the spiritual discipline of worship is one of the best ways to train our attention and our habits in just this way. The best way is to continually fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, even in the midst of life's storms. We come here, whether we're grieving, whether we're facing joy, whether we're facing a loss, we come here to reorient ourselves, to fix our eyes on Jesus. For despite the dissonances and the distractions in the music, for those who have trained their eyes to see and their ears to hear, it remains possible if only barely possible, to catch glimpses of the main theme of our Lord subverting death and sin and doubt through his resurrection life anywhere. Last week we talked about the practice of Sabbath. Sabbath is a way to make space in our calendars and in our lives so that we might pay attention to something other than the press of the storms and the success and the survival that consumes our days. But once we have made that space, carved out a blank spot, it is important then to fill it. And worship is one of those practices to fill it with. In worship, we take up this story as we rehearse in word and in baptism and in supper the means of God's grace and salvation, nourishing us by body and blood, bringing us into the story drawing us through the waters from death to new life where these waters can be nothing now but the, the book of Revelation, sea of crystal. Perfectly calm, serene, refreshing, life-giving waters. In worship, we are reminded that, that this is our story, this is our song, this is our God, this is our salvation too, that we participate in, even here, even now, even today. We are so easily distracted the other six days of the week and even on Sundays by all that is wrong and all that is against us. We need this practice of worship, this sanctuary, to reorient us. To throw us back into the boat with the disciples who, in response to God's great salvation that is for them, who can do nothing else but worship. We easily forget. We take our attention off Jesus. But in worship, we are reoriented. In worship, we are constantly invited to remember again and believe. Dear people, we are not forsaken. Our Lord strides atop the waters still. And through his death and resurrection, we, his kingdom people, are saved. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, it sure is blowing hard out there, outside of this little boat. And as soon as we step back into it, we're going to have a real hard time remembering you. Because there is so much, so much that presses on our lives. So many ordinary little details to attend to that distract us. And so many big things that cause us to grieve, that cause us to fear, that cause us to worry. So much so that we forget that always you invite us to simply turn to you and to remember and to believe that you are with us and that you will hold on to us even in this storm and that you will save us still. Remind us today. Reorient us today. Set our feet back on those beautifully paved kingdom streets, even in the midst of our storms, that we might be your people, saved, held, belonging to you, in body and soul, in life and in death. We pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for listening in. Hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. And as you journey on into your week ahead, go with God's blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.